your Bibles, we're in Luke chapter 9. We'll be reading from uh, verse uh, 51 to 62. Luke 9 verse 51 to 62. As you find in your, your, your spot, a couple of years ago, this is BC, before kids, uh, we went to, uh, it was a family, myself, my brother-in-law, sister-in-law, uh, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law wouldn't go. And Natalie and I, we went off to Drakensberg. We camped in uh, Mahai at the foot of the Northern Bergs. It was beautiful. And the one morning we woke up, my brother-in-law was like, come. That looks like a nice hill. Let's go see what's up there. And I'm like, awesome. I like seeing what's at the top of the hill. And so we set out. We set out on this journey. We kind of got a backpack. We started walking. And this little set out to see what was on top of a, 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 a hill turned into a five-hour trek. That was not a hill. It wasn't a, it was a mountain. It was a, let's be real. It was an entire mountain. So five hours, I get there. I'm covered. I, this white shirt that I really liked at the time has since been thrown away. Because at that stage, it was yellow from my sweat. And I was like, done. This is the autumn. Like late autumn, early winter. No, wait. Uh, yeah, late autumn, early winter. That's right. Um, and it's cold, but I'm sweated through. Like, I'm done. And it's five hours. I'm not a hiker. Let's just be real. I'm not a hiker. But I was like, okay, I've been five hours to get up here. That means I've got five hours to get back. Fortunately, it was steep going down, and we just decided to run, which I'm a better runner than a hiker, I must admit. And we got down, and the whole trip was eight hours start to finish. I got back, I was broken. Like, I just got back, I'm like, I food, and I started eating. I slept like the dead, even though it was freezing that night. But the reality is, the, the views at the top of that mountain were unbelievable. It was beautiful. It was an amazing journey. It's something I, I'm so grateful that I did. However, had my brother-in-law, who knew exactly what he was doing, said, hey, this is going to be an eight-hour trek. Are you keen? I'd have been, I'm out. I'm going to sit by the fire and be warm. <laughs> But he didn't. He's like, yeah, let's just go up the hill. It'll be fun. And I'm like, I like hills. Let's go up the hill. <laughs> now, the thing is, if I had heard that it was eight hours, I would have missed out on the journey and the wonder and the views and the story that I'm telling you right now. <laughs> now, the reality is often journeys need to be deceptive. And I use that word in big inverted commas. The, the end of the journey or the struggle of it often needs to be not in our mind. If we are going to set out of it. And I'm going to make the suggestion tonight that that is in fact the whole of the Christian walk. God has not told you where you're going. And he's done that on purpose. Because he doesn't want you to get disheartened. Which means that what he's taking you to is far greater and far worse than you might imagine right now. But he knows you can do it. And he's leading us. That's what we're going to read about in our text tonight. In Luke chapter 9 verse 51 to 62. So let's read together. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. But Luke chapter 9 verse 51 to 62. When the days drew near for him to be taken up. He set his face to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. Who went and entered a village of the Samaritans. To make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him. Because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven to consume them? He turned and rebuked them. Same word that he used for the, uh, the demons earlier. And they went to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, Foxes have holes, birds have, of the air have nests, but I, the Son of Man, have no way to lay my head. To another said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now the Lord bless the reading of his word tonight. Now, what I love about this story is that it is harsh. Like it's not easy read. 
We like to play games with these kind of texts. Like Jesus didn't really mean that. And we miss the paradox of what Jesus is calling us to do. We miss the harshness of it. We miss the crisis that it's supposed to bring into us. And so Luke, the author of this, gives us insights into the disciples, into what they were dealing with, so that we too might be encouraged to follow after this Jesus. Now what's interesting is, and that's what I love about it, Jesus knew where he was going. But none of the disciples did. In fact, that's been painfully clear in the last couple of passages, if you've been with us in the last couple of weeks. They have no idea what lies ahead. But Jesus, the word says, he sets his face to where he will be taken up. He sets his face to death, to Jerusalem. So that's our first point tonight. He sets, setting his face. This text, the start of it, shows us that Jesus was steadfastly connected, committed, and going to his goal. He knew it completely. He understood it completely. But none of the people around him did. We know from previous texts, the disciples didn't get this. They didn't get the mission he was on. They were happy to follow him. They were stoked. Jesus, this guy's great. They have no clue what was coming. I want to share to you now, church, that is a grace to them. It was a grace because had the disciples known, had they knew what lay ahead, none of them would have set out on this journey. Not one of them. And again, I'm going to say, that is your walk with Christ. That is your walk with Christ. If you know where He is leading you, if He was to open up the curtains of your life and say, there is it, start to finish, you would probably have a heart attack on the spot giver. You would say, no, I'm done, I'm out. Lord, I'm out. And that's a grace in your life. Don't you see that? I mean, let's be real. We live in an age where most of us sitting here are like, what is going on? Right? Church, that's a grace. This frustration that you feel, this pain and angst of like, God, where are you leading me? What are you doing? Why am I going through this? Grace. God is leading me. One of my personal favorites, one of my friends saying, I know it says that God will never test you beyond what you can handle. Well, I think God has seriously overestimated what I can handle. <laughs> I love that. Because isn't that often you get into a situation and you are in it. I mean, God is taking you through the ringer. And you're like, God, like, <laughs> okay, I, I'm, I trust in your sovereignty, but can I make a suggestion? I'm about to die. <laughs> like, I can't cope. Disappointments, failures, setbacks, challenges. And we're like on our knees and saying, Lord, no more. And he's like, just one more. You got this. He knows exactly what you're doing. He knows exactly what you're going to do. And so if you're in a situation right now where you feel like you can't cope, I want to give you an encouragement tonight. God knows exactly what lays ahead. And let me illustrate this to you. Look back in your life. And look where you are now, if you've been walking faithfully with God for any length of time. And tell me if you from now would go back to past you and say, this is where we are going. How would past you handle it? I would have been, I'm out. Hashtag that. I mean, just on a stupid level, just to throw this out there. I got to uh, college, university. With the sum total of two books under my belt, reading from start to finish. One was Solo's Journey about a cat, which was really great, and then The Fox Busters. Two high quality, intellectual, demanding reads. So like, you get to college at BDC, the Baptist Theological, they ask you to list the books you've read. I'm like, Shakespeare's play. <laughs> 
I kind of read it. And then my two books. And they look at it. I remember the register. He's like, there's three books here. And I'm like, yeah, pretty impressive. Eh? He's like, no, you're going to read that in under a week here. Are you going to cope? And I was like, as, as a foolish first year student, I'm like, God's led me here. He will enable me. I wasn't ready. <laughs> I remember reading my first theological text, and I don't suffer from ADD. I suffer from multiple focus ability. But it does mean that I can only concentrate on any task for like three seconds before my brain's like, ooh. <laughs> and I remember reading through the first text, and I think I picked up um, Panenberg's um, uh, uh, history, history on Salvation. I mean, it's not an easy read. And I read like three lines in it, and I'm like, butterfly. <laughs> Okay, no wait, focus bearing. Four lines, guitar, let's stop playing a little bit. <laughs> now if I, Barry 2022, had gone back and said, okay, in the first semester of your college today, you're gonna to be reading through 1500 pages, just in two weeks. And then you'll still have about 30 other texts that you'll have to get through in four months. But you'll be able to do it. I would have looked at future me, past me would have looked at future me and said, that's not my future. I hate reading. That's not me. I'm out. God knows where you're going. You don't. And so when you are in the crisis, like these disciples were, they had no clue. They were making mistakes. When you're in there making mistakes, don't blame God and say you don't know what you're doing. God knows exactly where he's leading. And in fact, he will allow you to hit these obstacles and make these mistakes because there's lessons in them. Which is our second point. Obstacles and lessons. Again, Jesus knew. His face was set to, Samir, I mean, to Judah. Uh, Jerusalem, sorry. The, direct, the most direct line that he could have gone is through, Jeruz, uh, through Samaria. Most Jews would have gone the extra 50 miles to avoid Samaria, because they kind of, you know, hated them. The Samaritans kind of hated the Jews. And that's what we see in this text. So Jesus is like, I'm going. I know this is going to cause issues. This is going to cause, and let's be real, this is going to cause racial issues, tensions. But I have no time to waste. And so Jesus just goes straight through and instantly, boom, hostility, lack of of help, just issues, and racial tension. John picks up on this, John and James, and he's like, these half-breed Samaritans, they don't follow Jesus, they don't follow God, Yahweh, they've got their own false gods. God! And then he's got his mind. Elijah. With the evil king's army coming before Elijah. And Elijah says, well, if I'm a man of God, let fire fall from heaven consume you. And 50 men, boof, burnt flames three times. Eventually the third, uh, the third group, so twice, the third group comes and like, you're a man of God, please just come. Please, please do not burn us. And John has this picture in mind. He's like, this is the man of God. These guys are just being a little bit like, you know, not kosher. And yes, that was a pun. God, come on, Jesus, let's pull heaven down, fire, <laughs> and what does John do, oh, I'm sorry, what does Jesus do, he scolds him, that's what the word there is, rebuke is such like a, not a good word, he scolds him, why, because John needed this, John needed to be embarrassed, John needed to realize that his idea of where he was going and Jesus' idea of where he was going was not in connection. And then suddenly a flood of questions come up. Right? That's what we read in the text. Well, God, okay, Jesus, we're following you. I want to just run through to catch your mind what Jesus said. Jesus, we're following you. Jesus, the guy said, we're following Jesus says, well, I'm homeless. Follow me. Jesus will follow you. But just let me do something. You know what? You want to do anything else but follow me. Even bury your dead, which was a duty to a Jew. Let the dead bury the dead. All that matters is the mission. 
Jesus, we want to follow you, but, but I have obligations to my family. If you have any other obligations but me, you're not worthy of this kingdom. Other texts, Gospels, Jesus will say, if you do not hate your father and mother in comparison to me, you shouldn't be called mine. Jesus unveils a birth. He exposes exactly what lays ahead. Not in full detail, but he's like, guys, you need to own this now. And we get to, don't we? We get to crossroads in our Christian walk. Where suddenly God just stops. He like, he'll nurse us, he'll nurse us, he'll let us play, he'll let us play. And suddenly he's like, okay, enough. You need to make a commitment. Now, that's what happened to the disciples here. There's a fork in the road. Even with John, there was a fork in the road because Jesus knew that John would not cope with what was coming had he let this sit. Now, going back to our opening illustration, climbing the Drakensberg, not knowing the full extent of the journey helps set you up, right? But if you don't make preparations, if you don't have someone who at least knows and making preparations, you are in trouble. My brother-in-law knew exactly, I'm still actually thinking about this. <laughs> actually, this might have been a punishment to me, but we won't go into that. He actually knew exactly what he was doing. He took extra food and water, he packed everything. I'm like, this is, oh, come on, we're going up a hill. He's like, no, just take, just take this and take that. I'm like, we're we going up a hill, no, just take this. And if we hadn't taken that, their journey would have been impossible. And that's the thing, church. As we get to these crossroads in our lives, as God says, you know what? This you need to learn now. Why? Because He's still on the journey with you. And if you're not going to make those transitions, you're not going to cope. That's what Paul would write later. Don't you know that a father must, must discipline his children? You, when you've been disciplined, it's because your father loves you. And he knows where he's taking you. Again, it's a grace. He's developing you into what he needs you to be for what lies ahead. So what lies ahead, church? That's the question. What lies ahead for us? It's not a better you. And this is where the tension of the sermon lies. It's, it's so easy to make this sermon like a motivational talk. You know, get up, do more, take ownership of yourself. Discipline equals freedom and every other kind of, you know, uh, self-help guru that could be thrown in here. God doesn't want a better you. Do you, do you realize that? God wants a new you. This is the, new, the third point. A new way to be human. One of my chief convictions that's been growing uh, over the last several years, one of the deep core philosophies of my theology, if you could put it that, not really, but like one of the things I really am settling in, is that God has not come into this world as Jesus Christ to make us more spiritual. Jesus Christ came into the world so that we might be human, truly human. Now being human, being truly human means that we are engaged with the spiritual nature of the divine. God is spirit and we are engaged with that. But it's not that we are trying to escape our bodies. God is trying to make us really, truly human. And to do that, he has to remake us. He wants a whole new you, a whole new humanity. And you know what that humanity looks like? It's insane, actually, when you start to think about it. It's Jesus. Romans 8, verse 29. Listen to these verses. Romans 8, verse 29. For those God foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be firstborn 
among many brothers and sisters. Listen to that text again. We need to get this. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, so that He might be firstborn amongst many brothers and sisters. Predestined. It's a pretty simple word to, when you have to think about it. The destination is set in advance. That's what it means. What is our destination, church? To be like Jesus. To be conformed into the image of His Son. Put simply, church, your destiny, your destiny is to be like Jesus. Now, there's a danger there. Is there's a lot of Jesuses out there. Everyone has their own personal Jesus. And that's not what God wants. God doesn't want to make a Jesus in your image. He wants to make you into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, who we read about in the Scriptures. Now, you have the almost Father Christmas Jesus, right? This is the Jesus who just wants everyone to be happy. He just loves everyone. He wants to give you gifts. If you ask Him, He, just, you know, he wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and happy. I call Him the Father Christmas Jesus. Because you have to be good to get those things. You know, or else you get cold from it. But Jesus doesn't want you to be happy. In fact, happy has got to be one of the stupidest things that we've believed in. That the goal of man is to be happy. It's the, it's the worst of goals. I do this to my kids. and uh, Again, maybe I'll take this out like I, took, I have to take out William's things uh, uh, this week. I might take this out of the, the recording. But often my kids will come up to me and they are grumpy. And they are like upset and they just they, they hate life and they are crying. And my instinct is to make them laugh. Which they hate. Because I'm very good at it. And then they'll see the smile. And they're like, no, I want to be happy. But I said, look, you just smile. So you're choosing to be grumpy. We can choose happiness. But it's not a great goal. It's fleeting. It's an emotion. It's a dumb thing to aim our lives at. It's a product, a byproduct of doing something of meaning. And God doesn't want you to be happy. God wants you to be like Jesus. To be full of purpose and full of life. And guess what? That's happiness. In fact, what does Jesus do? How does He fill His joy? He sets His face to the cross. Right? God doesn't want you to be happy. What about the more liberal lovers love Jesus? You know? You know this Jesus. Everyone's welcome. There's no sins. We're not going to talk about sins. Jesus is gentle and loving and He just wants everyone in. Hugs people. Hugs. You know, the Jesus, I believe, would never do that. And I'm like, yeah, that's not Jesus. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. From this text, some guy comes up to him and says, Jesus, like, listen, my, my dad's died. Can I just go bury him? And Jesus is like, let the dead bury their dead. That doesn't sound like Jesus loving everyone, right? Do yourself a favor. Go into a liberal church today and try to say, you know what? Jesus hates people who go marry and bury their dead. He's got no time for them. That doesn't sound like a liberal, loving, everyone welcome Jesus, right? Because it's not who God is. In fact, real love often has intense no's. It denies because it loves. If you do not deny people anything, you don't love them. If you let someone get away with whatever they want to, you don't love them. In fact, you are indifferent to them. Do you ever wonder why kids, when parents give no boundaries, start going crazy? Because that parent is actually saying to that ch child, I have no actual desire to put any effort into you. 
And that kid is just screaming, saying, Someone notice me. Put a boundary, please. Because real love says, no, I will not let you do stuff that hurts you. That's what God does. God says, no. What about the moralistic Jesus? This is the strong Jesus. The Jesus who knows all the rules and tells you exactly how to live. The people who follow this Jesus always have an answer for everything. And always tell you exactly what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. And they know that you are one of them because you are doing such and such. And in fact, often their such and such, their rules, are pretty much the rules of their culture. It's cherry-picked from the Bible. And the world today has actually accused all Christians of this type of Christianity. You follow some rules of Jesus, but you don't follow others. You follow some of the Bible, but you don't follow all of it. What is going on? Well, this is the moralistic Jesus. This is the Jesus who fits into my kingdom. But Jesus says to these, no one who puts his hand to the plow and even looks back is fit for the kingdom. In other words, you need an ethic, you need a mor moral that is greater than all your culture, that you will never set aside, that you will encompass your whole life to what Scripture says. Or else you're not fit to be his. And so church, I'm going to make the suggestion, you know what's lacking from all all the Jesus is in our own image. It's one simple thing. They all lack a cross. They all lack the horror that lay ahead these disciples and Jesus himself. You see, church, Jesus always leads us to where we need to be. And you know where we need to be? The cross. That's why we do this. We need this. Going back to the starting illustration. The mountain view top. The vistas at the peak. Is only possible if you are able to and willing to walk through the valley of death. That's what Jesus calls us to. I love the way Bonifer puts it in his book Life Together. He says, and I quote, We cannot find the cross of Jesus if we are afraid to, of going to the place where Jesus can be found. To the public death of a sinner. I'm going to be honest with you tonight. Because again, I'm going to be my brother-in-law to me. I'm going to tell you what lies ahead. Or else you might not set out on the journey. Church... Brothers and sisters, there is humiliation ahead. There is exposure ahead. There is being honest with yourself and your sins ahead. Because those are the things that are killing you. And God is going to put them to death whether you like them or not. I'm going to say this straight up. You are heading towards a cross as a Christian. That's the destiny. The beauty of this, and I want you, if you have been a Christian for any length of time, just look back. The beauty of this is there's a grace enough for every moment. Is there not? Has God ever failed us on the journey so far? If you are outside of this journey, I encourage you. I know this sounds terrifying. This is not a sales pitch for Christianity. If you are not taking the journey yet, I want to encourage you. There is grace at every moment. In fact, so much grace that you will be amazed. It's the famous line by John Newton goes. Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. It was grace that brought me safe thus far. And grace will lead me home. I'm inviting you, church, to a mountaintop journey. You know what the end is? You will be like 
God's son. But there is a journey. Not that you have to do, but that he will lead you through. And on every step will be the grace of the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Well, Lord, you lead us more and more to a place where we, as we've sung tonight, where we need you. Oh, we need you, Lord. We will need you every hour, every moment, every second. Lord, isn't that, isn't that the reality of our being? Lord, we are made for you. We are made to run on you, in a sense, to, to live off you. And until we are Christ-like, there's so much that needs to die and to be chipped off and polished away. And so, Lord, we want to follow you where you lead us. Lord, even if tonight, if there's someone here tonight that's at the point of saying, Lord, I want to give up. I'm just done. Holy Spirit, may your grace fill them. And may they feel their own soul rise up and say, Dad... I know you're with me. You are leading me through this because you know where I am going. So Lord Jesus, we lay ourselves at your cross tonight and say, with all of our lives, we trust you. We trust you, Jesus. Therefore go, and we will not turn aside, we will follow. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand and be singing?